Good morning. My name is Frank Rose, and I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings. Thanks for joining us for this morning <clears throat> program on the future of U.S. extended deterrence. And we have a great program this morning to explore a very important but extremely complicated national security issue. Our program this morning will consist of two parts. First, we'll kick off the event with a keynote address by David Trachtenberg, the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, who will outline the Trump administration's approach to extended deterrence. Secretary Trachtenberg's address will be followed by a panel discussion with three distinguished experts in the field to explore the issues in greater detail. On that note, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Mr. David Trachtenberg, the Deputy <coughs> Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, back to Brookings. Secretary Trachtenberg has more than 35 years of experience in working in the private sector, the executive branch, and the legislative branches of government. Immediately prior to assuming his current position in October 2017, Secretary Trachtenberg served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Short Waiver Consulting, LLC, a national security consultancy. But this is not the first time uh, he has served at the Pentagon. From 2001 to 2003, Secretary Trachtenberg was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy, where he was my boss. Uh, in addition to his work at the Department of Defense <laughs> in the private sector, he's also served on the House Armed Services Committee as a professional staff member. Um, Secretary Trachtenberg will provide about 20 to 25 minutes of opening remarks. Following that, he's kindly agreed to take some questions from the audience. So therefore, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, David Trachtenberg. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Frank, very much for the, uh, for the kind in introduction. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here, Frank. I appreciate the invitation to come back to Brookings and speak with you today on, on a topic that is uh, uh, very important to discuss, although this is a fine spring day, and I'm sure uh, we'd all rather be talking about uh, other things uh, than uh, nuclear weapons issues on a, on a nice spring day like today. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I'm pleased to be here, and I certainly appreciate <laughs> the opportunity to exchange views on this important subject. I had a professor at Georgetown once who said, who taught these particular issues. Uh, and his, uh, uh, his one regret was that uh, he didn't teach a course in art history because he thought art history was a lot more uplifting than this, this subject matter, uh, which, I, uh, which I fully understand. But uh, notwithstanding that, uh, I've been asked to discuss the future of extended deterrence. And, Put simply, uh, because, it, because it is a complex issue, put simply, when we talk about extended deterrence, we are talking about the ability to prevent adversary aggression against our friends and allies by extending our protection to them. And this includes the protection offered by our nuclear forces, which is why Extended deterrence is often sort of colloquially referred to as the U.S. nuclear umbrella. It's a way of assuring allies that the United States has their back and is committed to their security. So what I'd like to do is put this ongoing and long-standing U.S. commitment in context. First, I, I would like to give a brief overview of the security environment as described in the National Defense Strategy and the Nuclear Posture Review. Uh, then I'd like to spend a few minutes talking a bit uh, uh, about central deterrence, in particular the, relation, the relevance and importance uh, of our nuclear modernization program as the foundation 
upon which we build our extended deterrence commitment to allies. Uh, then I'll give some thoughts on uh, the allied perspective uh, and then sort of sum up by addressing the continued importance of our uh, constructive ambiguity doctrine and why a no first use policy with respect to nuclear weapons uh, really uh, is not called for in today's uh, environment. So uh, as far as the broader context goes, the 2018 National Defense Strategy rightly describes today's security environment as more complex, volatile, and dangerous than any in recent memory. Today, the principal issue facing the department is the eroding U.S. military advantage vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. Uh, for years, our competitors have developed military concepts and capabilities intended to make it more difficult and costly for the United <laughs> States to intervene in the defense of our allies, partners, and interests. The conventional force dominance that we have enjoyed for decades has created an incentive for our competitors not only to upgrade their own conventional military forces, but to rely more heavily on nuclear weapons in their strategies as a way of asymmetrically offsetting our conventional force advantages. Russia and China have both strengthened and North Korea has developed the ability to threaten or use nuclear weapons as a means of challenging the West and overturning the established international order that the United States helped create after World War II. Disturbingly, this includes an apparent increased willingness by Russia to contemplate the limited use of nuclear weapons, as evidenced by Russian leadership statements, military exercises, and nuclear force investments. These investments uh, include the modernization of Russia's large number of non-strategic or so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and the deployment of a ground launch cruise missile in clear violation of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, or INF, treaty. Thus, maintaining the efficacy of nuclear deterrence is as important today as it has ever been. While the reemergence of great power competition makes extended deterrence more critical and arguably more challenging than ever before. Now, in committing to defend NATO members in Europe and our allies in Asia, the United States helps deter would-be aggressors from attempting to leverage their expanded and modernized nuclear capabilities to alter the existing political, territorial, and security arrangements. We understand that the security environment has changed and that nuclear threats are more prevalent for our allies today than they have been in years and that as a result, allies feel new anxieties. To this end, the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review not only emphasized the importance of extended deterrence to achieving U.S. objectives, but went further to clarify that the assurance of allies and partners is one of the four explicit roles for U.S. nuclear weapons. This assurance role, in combination with the role of deterring both nuclear and non-nuclear attack against the United States, its allies and partners, reflects an ongoing U.S. policy commitment to the continued importance of extended nuclear deterrence in our strategy. Now, at this point, I think it's important to note that the United States cannot credibly extend 
nuclear deterrence unless it can ensure its own security with some degree of confidence. Thus, I would argue, extended deterrence does not exist in a vacuum. Rather, the credibility of extended deterrence hinges on the robustness and reliability of central deterrence, that is, namely, the continued effectiveness of our strategic nuclear forces. So there's a clear linkage between our central strategic forces and the credibility and reliability of our nuclear umbrella. Uh, as a recent article co-authored by a Brookings senior fellow named Frank Rose recently stated, quote, America's nuclear capabilities underpin its key alliances and are a crucial bulwark against growing Russian and Chinese regional aggression. Now, to this end, the NPR's tailored deterrence strategy underpinned by flexible nuclear capabilities, is intended to ensure that potential adversaries do not miscalculate regarding the consequences of their nuclear threats or actual nuclear use. The 2018 NPR, consistent with the findings of all previous nuclear posture reviews, produced by both Republican and Democratic administrations, endorsed the nuclear triad as the most cost-effective and strategically sound structure for ensuring effective deterrence. The triad, of course, <clears throat> is the combination of land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, sea-based or sea-launched ballistic missiles, and strategic bombers on which our ultimate deterrent rests. The triad's synergies and complementary attributes, for example, the reliability and dispersion of our land-based missile force, the survivability of our sea-based platforms, and the flexibility of our bombers, has served us well for decades and provide the mix and range of capabilities needed to continue effective deterrence in today's dynamic security environment. Given the breadth of the roles of nuclear weapons identified in the Nuclear Posture Review and the diverse and dynamic threats the United States faces in the 21st century, it's imperative that the United States possess a diverse range and mix of nuclear forces to enable us to tailor deterrence to unique adversary characteristics and objectives. But the triad we have today is now operating far beyond its originally planned service life. Uh, in fact, over the past 25 years, the United States has made only modest, relatively modest investments in basic nuclear sustainment, life extension, uh, and operations. Most of the nation's nuclear delivery systems on which we rely for deterrence were built in the 1980s or, or even earlier. Uh, and despite multiple efforts to keep them functional long beyond their intended, originally intended lifespan, we cannot keep them operational and reliable in perpetuity. So if not recapitalized, modernized, upgraded, these forces will simply age into obsolescence. That is not an acceptable outcome. Therefore, consistent with the approach taken by the prior administration, the fiscal year 2020 budget request funds all critical Department of Defense modernization requirements helping to ensure that modernization or that modern replacements will be available before the nation's legacy systems reach the, e the end of their extended service lives. Uh, our uh, DOD budget uh, for uh, the request for nuclear forces is about $25 billion, which sounds like an awful lot of money, and of course uh, it, it is, but it is only roughly 3.5% 
of the overall Department of Defense budget, relatively small fraction. And that, this includes about $8 billion for recapitalization programs. Recapitalization programs include the B-21 bomber, the ground-based strategic deterrent, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, the long-range standoff cruise missile, as well as the Columbia-class nuclear ballistic missile submarine. Also includes uh, slightly more than $16 billion to sustain and operate our nuclear forces. This expenditure is both necessary and affordable. As a relative share of the DOD budget, our planned spending on nuclear modernization at the height of the modernization program will not exceed 7%. Uh, this is still less in percentage terms than the major modernization efforts that took place in the 1960s and in the 1980s. But more importantly, because our nuclear forces are the ultimate guarantor of our security, it's dangerous to assume we can guarantee deterrence on the cheap. Although maintaining the efficacy of our nuclear triad requires a significant and a sustained level of investment, I would argue the costs of sustaining an effective nuclear deterrent are far less than the cost of failing to do so. As the Bipartisan National Defense Strategy Commission stated in its recent review, we believe that the 2018 NPR offers an appropriate option for meeting U.S. nuclear deterrence and assurance requirements in this era of major power rivalry, and we urge DOD to proceed along the path the NPR lays out. Our extended deterrence posture depends on the credibility of central deterrence, and this, in turn, depends on the successful completion of our modernization program. Now, extended deterrence poses a more complex set of challenges for the United States than central deterrence for several reasons, and for example, uh, the United States must possess deterrence capabilities that are credible from the adversary's perspective, with credibility being a function of both U.S. capability and the will to exercise that capability. In essence, the will to go to war, possibly nuclear war, in the defense of others. In addition, the U.S. commitment must be viewed as credible by our allies that we are seeking, who we are seeking to defend, and their views regarding the credibility of our security guarantees to them may differ. For example, our Asian allies may have a different view of what it takes to assure them of our security commitment than our European allies, and even our European allies may hold different views among themselves. Finally, of course, in the unlikely event that deterrence fails, hopefully unlikely event, obtaining and maintaining domestic support to actually employ nuclear weapons on behalf of an ally may be particularly challenging, especially if doing so exposes the U.S. homeland to a devastating counter-strike. Therefore, missile defenses also have an important role to play in bolstering the credibility of our extended deterrent. So what are we doing from an extended deterrence perspective to credibly assure our allies? Well, first, the national security strategy provides a clear commitment to allies, noting in part that together with them, we can successfully deter and, if necessary, defeat aggression against U.S. interests and increase the likelihood of managing competitions without violent conflict. Follow-on guidance reflected in the National Defense Strategy directs both that we take steps to build a more lethal force and strengthen our allies and partners by expanding regional consultative mechanisms and collaborative planning 
in order to create an extended network capable of deterring or decisively acting to meet the shared challenges of our time. In addition, both the Nuclear Posture Review and the Missile Defense Review describe the importance of allies and partners to U.S. national security and the central role played uh, uh, by both nuclear and missile defense capabilities in extended deterrence. Now, while my remarks are, are focused on nuclear extended deterrence, it's important to reiterate that missile defense does contribute to deterrence, deterring both threats to the homeland and to our regional allies and partners by undermining a potential adversary's confidence in his ability to achieve his desired political or military objectives. The uncertainty this creates uh, is about the success of an adversary's actions, coupled with the knowledge that the United States has the ability to respond with a counterattack of its own, should make an adversary think twice about launching missiles against the United States or our allies or partners. As such, missile defense directly supports U.S. extended deterrence guarantees. With regard to Europe, the U.S. commitment to NATO is unwavering. A strong, cohesive nuclear alliance is the most effective means of deterring aggression and promoting peace and stability in the Euro-Atlantic region. And our extended deterrent is a demonstration of our commitment to maintaining the security of the alliance. Importantly, NATO is addressing the changed security environment to make clear that any employment of nuclear weapons against NATO, however limited, would not only fundamentally alter the nature of a conflict, but would result in unacceptable costs to an adversary that would far outweigh the benefits it could hope to achieve. Since the 2014 Wales Summit, NATO has initiated measures to ensure that its overall deterrence and defense posture, including its nuclear forces, remains capable of addressing any potential adversary's doctrine and capabilities. This draws on NATO's long-standing commitment to adapt its posture to changes in the security environment. While many of NATO's specific nuclear adaptation efforts remain classified, the United States has publicly demonstrated its commitment to the alliance by extending the life of the B-61 gravity bomb, a stance that was reaffirmed in the 2018 NPR. Uh, the B-61-12 gravity bomb will replace earlier versions of the B-61, uh, will have a lower yield and better accuracy than earlier variants. The United States is also incorporating nuclear capability onto the F-35A aircraft to be used by the United States and several NATO allies as a replacement for the current aging dual-capable aircraft. Current U.S. dual-capable aircraft able to deliver that weapon include the F-15E. Several NATO allies also provide aircraft capable of delivering U.S. nuclear weapons forward deploy to Europe. So Im improved aircraft readiness and the arrival of the fifth generation F-35 in conjunction with the B-61 gravity bomb will preserve NATO's ability to contribute to regional deterrence and assurance. While the foregoing efforts are focused on NATO, the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review also announced two supplemental U.S. nuclear capabilities intended to deny regional adversaries the mistaken confidence that any limited nuclear employment can provide a useful advantage over the United States and its allies and partners. This initiative was largely based on Moscow's perception that its greater number and variety of non-strategic nuclear systems may provide it with a coercive advantage in crises and at lower levels of conflict. Thus, the NPR concluded that the United States must adapt its existing forces with two modest supplemental capabilities to ensure that Russia, China, and others do not perceive an exploitable gap 
in our regional deterrence posture. The goal of these supplements is to discourage adversaries from even contemplating limited nuclear attacks, thereby strengthening deterrence and helping to prevent conflict in the first place. By modifying a small number of existing sea launch ballistic missile warheads to provide a low yield option, and by restoring a modern nuclear sea launched cruise missile to the force, the U.S. will have credible response options to nuclear attacks of any magnitude. The low yield sea launched uh, ballistic missile and nuclear armed sea launched cruise missile are measured responses to close troubling gaps in regional deterrence that have emerged in recent years. In addition, redeploying a sea launched cruise missile addresses the enormous disparity in non-strategic nuclear forces without attempting to match Russia system for system. Uh, that is not our goal, and we are not attempting to match Russia system for system. Uh, as uh, uh, General Scaparotti said in testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee in March, and I'll quote him, Russia's non-strategic nuclear weapons stockpile is of concern because it facilitates Moscow's mistaken belief that limited nuclear first use, potentially including low-yield weapons, can provide Russia a coercive advantage in crises and at lower levels of conflict. The 2018 Nuclear Posture Review calls for adjustments to U.S. nuclear forces to close this perceived gap on the escalation ladder and reinforce deterrence against low-yield nuclear use. So both of these supplemental capabilities will complement our existing capabilities by providing assured, tailored options in the face of increasingly advanced air and missile defenses. Uh, in addition, the unique attributes of a nuclear sea launch cruise missile may incentivize Russia to accept constraints on its non-strategic nuclear capabilities. These two supplements do not require nuclear testing, do not violate any arms control treaties or other international obligations, and they do not lower the threshold for nuclear use. Rather, they are intended to raise Russia's threshold for employing nuclear weapons by convincing Russia that it would gain no advantage by using low-yield nuclear weapons or engaging in limited nuclear strikes. Now, over the last 10 years, allies in Europe and Asia have become much more engaged in discussions with us on extended deterrence issues. We have dedicated and regularly occurring deterrence dialogues with these allies, which is useful for emphasizing the continued importance of U.S. extended deterrence commitments. Despite all the challenges that go with maintaining effective and credible nuclear deterrence, the Alliance still values the U.S. extended deterrence commitment. As NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said at the Munich Security Conference last year, a world where Russia, China, and North Korea have nuclear weapons, but NATO does not, is not a safer world. That is why the ultimate guarantee of NATO's security is the strategic nuclear forces of allies, particularly those of the United States. And both the 2016 and 2018 NATO summit declarations reaffirm the importance of U.S. nuclear weapons and dual-capable aircraft contributions to NATO. Last year, the Brussels summit declaration explicitly stated NATO's deterrence posture relies on United States' nuclear weapons forward deployed in Europe and the capabilities and infrastructure provided by allies concerned. Russia's increasingly aggressive posture in recent years has not gone unnoticed by our European allies, highlighting the continued need for a credible U.S. extended deterrent. And in Asia, China's efforts to expand its influence, enhance its military reach, and develop its regional nuclear capabilities is a cause of concern for our partners in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, in Japan, strong public antipathy to nuclear weapons remains a challenge for U.S. extended deterrence. However, the United States and Japan have for years engaged in a regular extended deterrence dialogue that has informed and elevated 
each nation's understanding and insights as to the U.S. commitment. Uh, in South Korea, uncertainty surrounding progress on denuclearization may foster concerns over the implications of the U.S.-North Korea dialogue for extended deterrence. However, during the 50th U.S. Republic of Korea Security Consultative meeting, then Secretary of Defense Mattis and Minister of National Defense Zhang noted that U.S. forces in South Korea played a critical role in maintaining peace and security on the Korean Peninsula over the past 65 years and reiterated the U.S. commitment to maintain the force levels necessary to defend South Korea. In these ways, the transatlantic and transpacific alliances face quite similar challenges posed by major power neighbors who are, have prepared to achieve something of a fait accompli at the conventional level of war and to expand the scope, scale, and intensity of conflict if the U.S. and its allies attempt to reverse that fait accompli. Another issue that has implications for the continued viability of our extended deterrent is the issue of no first use, no first use of nuclear weapons. And let me state at the outset here that U.S. declaratory policy on this issue increases the credibility of our commitment that we are prepared to employ nuclear weapons if necessary on behalf of allies and partners. The United States has a well-established policy of calculated ambiguity regarding U.S. nuclear employment that has long deterred potential adversaries from nuclear coercion or aggression. It's a bipartisan policy, reiterated in some form or fashion by every presidential administration uh, since the early days of the nuclear era. Uh, notably, in 2009, the Bipartisan Congressional Strategic Posture Commitment, uh, Commission, led by former Secretaries of Defense William Perry and James Schlesinger considered whether the United States should adopt a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons and concluded that the United States, quote, should not abandon calculated ambiguity by adopting a policy of no first use, end quote. This policy pronouncement was right then and it continues to be right today. A policy of no first use would damage the health of our alliances because it could call into question the assurance in the eyes of our allies and partners that the United States will come to their defense in extreme circumstances. For NATO, neither the United Kingdom nor France have the full range of capabilities and associated options that the United States possesses. They cannot replace U.S. guarantees. Our Asian allies rely substantially on U.S. nuclear forces for their deterrence needs. And the adoption by the U.S. of a no first use policy could incentivize others to develop their own nuclear weapons, which would seriously undermine our nonproliferation policy. In fact, I would argue that our current policy is one of the greatest disincentives to nuclear proliferation today. Conventional forces are also unlikely to provide the same deterrent effect as nuclear weapons, as they may not be able to hold at risk those assets that an adversary values most, or they may not be positioned to respond in a timely enough manner to deter aggression in vital regions. Moreover, allies might feel the need to recalibrate how accommodating they might have to become to protect their interests in the face of nuclear armed adversaries. Adoption of a no first use policy would also cause U.S. declaratory policy to diverge from our UK and French counterparts, a significant fissure within the NATO alliance that potential adversaries could seek to exploit. Such a policy could embolden adversaries to test what they might perceive as a weakened US resolve to defend our allies and interests with every means at our disposal. This could simplify the decision calculus of potential adversaries and actually undermine the deterrent effect of our nuclear forces. Despite the apparent attractiveness to some of a no first use policy, no presidential administration has seen it necessary or wise to abandon the tradition of calculated ambiguity that has served us well for decades. Uh, given the security environment we currently face, as articulated in the National Defense Strategy, the NPR, and the Missile Defense Review, this is simply 
not the time to consider such a significant break from longstanding bipartisan precedent. So, uh, in summary, uh, let me say both the national security strategy and the national defense strategy released by this administration have emphasized the continuing importance of our allies and our alliances to the security of the United States. In turn, both the nuclear posture review and the missile defense review reinforce the importance of extending deterrence to our allies and partners. The bottom line is that extended deterrence reinforces the security relationships we have with allies. It sends a strong message of unity to potential adversaries, and it contributes to our non-proliferation goals and objectives. We are therefore committed to ensuring the continued viability of extended deterrence. By continuing the nuclear modernization programs begun under the previous administration, by continuing and expanding on the extended deterrence dialogues that we currently conduct with our treaty allies, by refining and clarifying U.S. declaratory policy as described in the Nuclear Posture Review, and by pursuing critical, though modest, supplements to our existing triad of nuclear forces, the low-yield ballistic uh, submarine-launched ballistic missile and the sea-launched cruise missile. These efforts underscore that nuclear deterrence remains the bedrock of U.S. national security. The U.S. nuclear deterrent must dissuade any adversary from mistakenly believing it can benefit from any use of nuclear weapons, even in a limited way, against the United States or its allies and partners. Our nuclear deterrent underwrites all U.S. military operations and diplomacy around the globe. It is the backstop and foundation of our national defense. So in an era of renewed great power competition, allies and partners should take comfort in knowing that the United States has the will and the flexible, resilient nuclear capabilities needed to deter nuclear attack and coercion against us as well as against them. Let me conclude just by thanking Brookings for the opportunity to come here today, present the Department's views, and discuss these issues that are critically important to our national security. And with that, uh, I'll be happy to take questions. So thank you all very much. Okay. Hello, Secretary Trachtenberg. Thank you for taking the questions. My name is Dan Leone. I'm a reporter with Defense Daily. I had a question actually about the Department of Energy, which is building a couple of facilities to make the triggers for the future GBSD warheads. Uh, both the Armed Services Committees have paled a little bit about the cost of doing two facilities and, and said, why not do one? So I wondered whether the DOE had gotten, given you any assurance that they can meet the timetable for the GBSD rollout if Congress limits them to one facility for these plutonium triggers? Uh, that's a great question for my colleagues at the Department of Energy, <laughs> who, I, who I wish were here uh, and, and, and would be better able to, uh, better able to address that. Uh, I'm aware of the issue, but uh, I wouldn't want to sort of step on my, uh, step on my colleagues' toes uh, by addressing the details of that. So um, uh, I'll, I'll defer <laughs> on, on that one uh, for, for the time being, at least. Thank you, Secretary. In Jung Cho with the Voice of America, if you could comment on the North Korean threat. Um, North Korea tested a um, new tactical weapon last week. And are there any signs that North Korea is advancing its military capabilities? And how is DOD currently preparing for a possible provocation by North Korea at a time when diplomacy is at a standstill? Thank you. Sure. Uh, good question. Uh, we hope there will not be a provocation uh, that the North Koreans will engage in. We are, of course, on the one hand, uh, uh, cautiously hopeful that the dialogue that we have engaged in with North Korea, that President Trump has engaged in with, with uh, Kim Jong-un, will lead to a positive development ultimate, uh, ultimately in the, the full, complete denuclearization 
uh, of, uh, uh, of North Korea. Uh, at the same time, we are certainly mindful. We are approaching these discussions and have been approaching these discussions with our eyes wide open. We're, we're certainly mindful of the, th of the capabilities that North Korea has produced. We're mindful of the threat uh, that uh, North Korea poses, uh, not only uh, directly to the United States, but to uh, our, our regional uh, friends uh, and allies uh, as well. So. Uh, we're hoping for the best. Uh, we are certainly not there yet. Uh, but we also understand that uh, while North Korea has refrained from uh, nuclear tests uh, and uh, ballistic missile tests uh, uh, in, uh, for quite some time, uh, we certainly understand that the capabilities that, uh, that North Korea possesses still exist. Uh, and still pose threats that we need to deal with. That was one, certainly one of the reasons why, uh, in our missile defense review, uh, we placed some significant emphasis on uh, missile defense capabilities, not just to defend the homeland, uh, but uh, regional defense capabilities as well. So uh, we, can be, we can be hopeful, but at the same time, uh, we are and need to continue to uh, look, at the, uh, look at the ongoing situation uh, with our eyes wide open, fully recognizing uh, uh, that there is a history there as well that we need to keep in mind. Hello, Secretary Trachtenberg. Mark Buckton from the National War College. Thank you for your uh, comments today and for taking questions. Um, my question has to do with um, progress on the low-yield W-76 warhead. Can you tell us anything about um, what the United States has done so far or is in the process of doing, and does the administration feel that it needs uh, Congress's permission to go forward with that? Uh, we have uh, we certainly made clear uh, what we intend to do uh, to the Congress. The Congress is, is aware of our plans on both the supplemental capabilities that I mentioned. With respect to the low-yield ballistic missile warhead, we're moving forward to do that. And, and again, I would, I would reemphasize uh, that uh, that is not the, what we're doing is not developing a new nuclear weapon. What we're basically doing uh, is we are taking an existing nuclear weapon uh, and we are modifying it in a way uh, such that uh, the yield of that weapon uh, is reduced. I, I have, have found it a little bit interesting because uh, many, uh, or uh, certainly some of the, the critics uh, of what we are, are doing have, have been arguing uh, against uh, a low-yield ballistic missile option on the grounds that it may make nuclear war or nuclear weapons more usable. That is certainly not our certainly not our intent, and I would argue it does just has just the opposite effect. Uh, it uh, makes uh, uh, nuclear weapons less usable from the standpoint of an adversary perspective. But, uh, you know, I, I'd also argue that uh, some of the, uh, I think some of the critics of our plan to lower the yield of uh, those uh, ballistic missile warheads have also been critical of, the, of uh, what they have seen as uh, the uh, high yields and the high explosive power and destructiveness of uh, the current nuclear arsenal. Uh, so on, on the one hand, uh, there, there are critics who argue we have too much destructive power in our nuclear arsenal, uh, at, but on the other hand, our efforts to sort of lower, lower the destructive potential of our weapons are also being criticized as making nuclear war or making nuclear weapons more usable. Uh, I think those sort of those positions are internally inconsistent, and in fact, I see what we are doing with respect to the low yield ballistic missile as a means, as I said, uh, of uh, hopefully uh, removing any misperceptions that an adversary might have that they have some kind of exploitable advantage uh, that uh, allows them to uh, take more risks, uh, engage in nuclear coercion, or actually to engage in, in aggression. Uh, even conventional aggression, uh, because they feel they have a capability on the nuclear side that the United States doesn't have, or uh, that the United States would be forced to take an action that could uh, immediately escalate a, uh, a conflict to a level that we, we certainly don't want to go down. Hi, this, uh, my name is Sang Min. I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. I have uh, one more question about North Korea. 
Uh, you mentioned that U.S. maintain formal extended trans dialogue with Republic of Korea. So I want to know what kind of uh, the discussion has been made during the uh, this dialogue with uh, Republic of Korea, and then what is the U.S. Uh, specific uh, extended uh, policy against North Korea? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part of that question. Okay. Uh, so you have been maintaining dialogue with uh, ROK about the uh, extended citizen policy against North Korea. So can you tell me specifically what have you been discussed about that? So what is the U.S. extended citizen policy against North Korea threat? No, we have been maintaining a dialogue uh, with the Republic of Korea. That, uh, that dialogue is ongoing. Uh, we talked to the Republic of Korea uh, when uh, we uh, uh, developed the uh, nuclear posture review. Uh, we made sure that uh, we were aligned uh, and that uh, the Republic of Korea, as well as our other allies, of course, uh, regionally, were aware of where we were going, what we were recommending, and why we were proposing to do that. I think it's been a robust dialogue uh, all along. I think it's been a productive dialogue all along. Uh, we are, of course, uh, aware of concerns with respect to North Korea and their programs and the threat North Korea capabilities pose. Uh, but I, I, I think overall, uh, I have to say the, the dialogue, the consultations, and the relationship that we've had with our allies on these particular issues that we are talking about here uh, has not only been very robust, I think it's been very well received by, by, by our allies and partners. Uh, and, you know, this is not sort of a one-and-done uh, opportunity here. Uh, we, we continue to engage in a variety of forums uh, on this and other issues with uh, our uh, Republic of Korea allies, uh, our Japanese allies, uh, uh, and uh, other friends and partners in the region. So, uh, overall, I think uh, it's, uh, it's been very well received and uh, a very, uh, leading to a very, very positive outcome. There were no surprises when we released the nuclear posture review in terms of uh, our allies' perceptions. Uh, they, they understand our rationale. They understand why we're going forward with the supplemental capabilities that we proposed. They understand our commitment to extended deterrence and to making sure that the relationships and the security guarantees that we provide uh, to our regional, <clears throat> excuse me, to our regional allies and partners, uh, are strong and and remain strong. And and this administration is committed to maintaining the strength of uh, of those security guarantees. Frank, you want to pick it? No, just one more question. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Hank Gaffney. I spent 13 years on NATO nuclear weapons and another 13 years of dialogues with the Russians. Well, I'll let you answer the DOE question. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, what's the prospects of real dialogues with the Russians? Uh, I keep hearing rumors that the administration is not going to uh, renew a uh, new start. Is that true? Um, and what are the prospects for actual dialogues with the Russians? Look, that's an, that, look, that is an excellent question. The prospect for, for dialogue with the Russians, we are certainly open to dialogue with the Russians. Uh, whether New START is renewed or not, uh, not renewed is an issue that has not been decided within the administration. It's one of any number of issues that, that we are looking at in the broader context of where are we going with the arms control dialogue with Russia. Uh, Russia, as you know, and as I alluded to in my remarks, uh, has for years been in violation of the INF Treaty. Uh, that says something about Russian behavior. Russia, uh, Russia has also been in violation of, its, uh, of some other treaty commitments. What does that mean? Do the Russians get to sort of pick and choose which treaties and which obligations they wish to comply with and which they, uh, uh, and which they don't? Uh, this is all part and parcel of a sort of a broader dialogue that we're having and a broader examination within the administration as, as to where do we go? What does the future of arms control look like? And more broadly, what is the future of our relationship with Russia? We would like, of course, for that 
the future of that relationship to be put on a more positive trajectory. It is uh, it it has not been on a positive trajectory, uh, primarily because of the actions that the Russians have taken and, and the behavior that we've witnessed in other areas, uh, whether it's with respect to Crimea, Ukraine, uh, whether it's respect to uh, Syria, uh, whether it's respect uh, you know, uh, with respect to other types of behavior and activities the Russians are engaged in. The Russians are engaged in a major military modernization program, uh, c completely uh, rescoping and replacing a lot of their uh, a lot of their nuclear systems, uh, both at the strategic level and the non-strategic level. What does that mean in terms of our ability to engage in dialogue with the Russians going forward? Uh, what does it mean for arms control? Uh, it's an excellent question. I, w I would say we are not. Cert we are certainly not opposed to talking to the Russians about where we go in the future. Unfortunately, Russia's behavior doesn't give a real cause for optimism, in my view, that we'll be able to get where we'd like to get with Russia down the road uh, in connection with future arms control agreements. Um, that doesn't mean we won't uh, you know, we won't consider consider trying. It just means we're in a situation today, based on Russian behavior, where I think it's become it has become increasingly difficult to move the needle uh, in a positive direction uh, on that dialogue. Hopefully, that will change. We haven't given up. So it sounds like a big new arms race. Oh no, not not at all. Uh, it takes two to race. Uh, as I said previously. You, we're not interested in matching the Russians system for system. The, Rus the Russians have been developing an incredible amount of, of new nuclear weapon systems, including the, the novel nuclear systems that President Putin unveiled to great fanfare uh, uh, you know, uh, a, number, a number of months ago. Um, the Russians are doing a number of things we are, we are not simply, simply not doing. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take some modest steps uh, in order to lower Russia's sense of confidence that what they're doing gives them some kind of exploitable advantage that uh, could lead to a miscalculation on their part that we absolutely don't want to see. Secretary Trachtenberg, thank you so much for coming today. I think you did a wonderful job providing us an overview of the Trump administration's uh, extended deterrence policy. You've given us a lot to chew on for the panel. So thanks again for coming to Brookings. My pleasure. Please join me in thanking Secretary Trachtenberg. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.